July 10th, the year 2018, will be marked as a watershed moment in the history of rail transportation. Across 175 miles of the otherworldly outback of Western Australia, three freight locomotives carried over 28,000 tons of iron ore to Cape Lambert. A large yet routine feat. However, this time, this was something out of the ordinary, or more accurately, missing. A human driver. On that day, Rio Tinto operated the largest fully autonomous robot in human history. In this video, we'll be going over the many advances occurring in the rail industry, from the Internet of Things or IoT and automation, to new speeds constantly being reached, and more importantly, how you, the passengers, the citizens, and the people of our myriad of nations and economies will benefit in the progress being made in the backbone of our infrastructure system. This is the train of the future. Welcome aboard. Rio Tinto's auto haul program has been in testing for years, with scheduled completion by the end of 2018 in order to modernize operations. This most recent journey was monitored in over Perth, Australia, a city over 930 miles away, and shows how far technology has come in the welcoming and transition to automation. All over the world and across different industries, we have started to become familiar with the advances in automation, artificial intelligence, and machine learning has brought to life. Everything from the personal assistants in our devices and phones that have begun offering suggestions and advice for daily life, to our automated automobiles which continue to make our roads safer and a tad more efficient. The biggest impact will be in the rail industry, due to just the sheer amount of capacities trains can hold over other modes of transportation, as well as the efficiency of kinetic movement and land usage versus the automobile. It's a lot easier to install a system of rules and software for a train network and you're able to move more people as well versus the same amount of work for autonomous automobiles. In fact, autonomous passenger rail transportation has existed for quite some time in the form of people movers in cities like Miami and in airports all over the US. The idea of automated trains is even older than that. In fact, the first example of such a railway was the Never Stop Railway built at the British Empire Exhibition in 1924 as an idea of an urban transportation system across the British colonies that would require no human operator. Even before the age of binary and software, the 88 train cars for this system ran on a mechanical system of pulleys and corkscrews that would modulate speed for passengers to enter and exit the vehicles automatically and increase to operational speed upon exiting the station, and it ran without a hitch for the two years it was operating at the exhibition. Most modern rail networks, however, are far more complex, and in most urban areas, passenger systems are the lifeblood that keeps economies moving, thus the need for advanced algorithms, backups, security, and connectivity. In a previous video on this channel concerning Walt Disney and Futurism, I stated, while we may not have been able to achieve the future our forefathers of forward thinking have imagined in a timely manner, the advances we have been making at present have begun to accelerate. Our economy has reached record high GDP growth and industrial companies are recording record profits, all while being augmented by advances in computer hardware that has accelerated beyond Moore's law in some instances. But it's not about gadgets and gizmos either. But the way trains move has also reached a fork in the road where we can begin to move trains efficiently through a number of ways, moving away from diesel technology that has dominated since post-World War II. Recently, Berlin hosted the 2018 Innel Trans Conference, where a number of new propulsion technologies were showcased and made their debut. A number of bi-mode trains that could run on both electrified catenaries and diesel engines were shown by big-name companies like Siemens, Stadler, and Alstom. The most notable example now is out in service is MTU's bi-mode engines powering Hitachi's Azuma line 
running in the UK under companies such as Great Western Railroad and Virgin Rails. Beyond diesel and electricity, there's been a movement into the hydrogen power trains, where Alstom revealed its Cordia Island at 2016 Innotrans, and now debuted for revenue service in Germany during Innotrans 2018, making it the world's first passenger train powered by hydrogen fuel cell. Indeed, the amount of ways a train can be powered nowadays is increasing, and as well as becoming more efficient and faster. Trains have come a long way from the steam-breathing behemoths of yore, and have become more aerodynamic as years in science have progressed. This year, the East Japan Railway Company has announced to test a new experimental train known as the Alpha X, capable of reaching speeds of over 250 miles an hour, while still using less energy than the current trains reaching 186 miles an hour. Electric trains on steel wheels and tracks are still not the fastest method of rail transportation available. Currently, the fastest method coming through magnetic levitation, better known as maglev, the most advanced example in the world today, also hails from Japan in the Yamanashi Prefecture, known as the Superconducting or SC maglev. Still in testing, a lucky few, including journalists and international politicians, have been able to experience the blistering world record speeds of the SC Maglev, a blistering 375 miles per hour, through mountains and under the alpine scenery of Mount Fuji. Beyond that, there have been promises of an even faster mode of ground transportation through the Hyperloop, first proposed by SpaceX through founder, CEO, and serial entrepreneur. Elon Musk. Musk first proposed the system in 2012 as a response to the California High Speed Rail Authority's mismanagement of cost for the massive rail project and construction in the state. While many have jumped on board the evacuated tube transport system as the solution for fixing America's transit woes, it has barely reached the promised speeds of Mach 1 or 760 miles an hour, only reaching a fraction. Empty shells for public viewing and unfulfilling its grand solution of carrying passengers. At least, to this day, not one human being has ever ridden on a hyperloop. To avoid red herrings, we need to focus on the main purpose of transportation, and that is to carry passengers. Lots and lots of passengers. And with the increasing amount of passengers and simultaneously staggering speeds around the world, there has also been a need for safety. This has been a major factor in train systems, and the reason why Japan's Shinkansen has had a grand total of zero passenger fatalities in its over 54 year history of operation. Despite operating the world's most earthquake prone country and carrying over 9 billion total passengers, more than the current total population of Earth. Apart from strict standards of separating rails from road crossings and slower rail traffic, the prime component to railroad safety records has been digital technology. Systems like Automatic Train Control, or ATC, can automatically stop a train if it's approaching a corner too fast, closing in on another train in front, or even in natural disasters, within mere milliseconds, in a business where time is crucial and your most precious cargo could be your passengers. In the US, where freight rail is the backbone of the economy, Implementation of the similar Positive Train Control System, or PTC, has been rather drawn out, and many experts, including the National Transportation Safety Board, have pointed to the lack of PTC for the cause of some of the most deadly accidents to occur in both freight and passenger rail accidents. In Europe, this has been a mostly different story, where PTC systems have been in place for years now. The European Train Control System, or ETCS, has multiple levels of tiers of interoperability between the different European nations, as well as safety standards. One of the market leaders in implementing this technology, Siemens, has made headway in the advancements of their capability, requiring less physical signals while increasing the available capacity, energy usage efficiency, and overall safety for operations. Network Rail the government-owned company which manages and owns most of Britain's rail network signed a 10-year contract for the installation and support of digitized ETCS, which includes the Train Protection Warning System. 
Similarly, in Norway, Bain-Nor, similar to Network Rail, signed a 25-year agreement with Siemens for what they consider will, quote, renew the complete Norwegian rail network into a full digital IP-based system with a real Internet of Things. With this, the blinking main signals we are already used to seeing along a train line will no longer be required, as the train driver will digitally receive the signal. With so many things being digitized and connected to along the industrial IoT networks, there is also a need for greater security. After all, if trains can be controlled without the need for a physical driver in the front of a train, or remotely from a control center, what can stop someone from their basement? or an enemy state's compound from sabotaging and damaging an infrastructure system. This interconnectivity is indeed a double-edged sword, and rail companies know that, with reminders from more recent cases in Seoul, South Korea, where the subway system was hacked in 2014, allegedly by South Korea's not-so-nice northern neighbor that compromised data on dozens of workers' computers. Thankfully, the trains themselves ran on a separate network to protect themselves. Some cyber attacks may seem more virtuous in nature, where everyone got free rides on San Francisco's Mooney system because of hackers exploiting outdated systems in the Fair Collection Machines network. It's a cat and mouse game on both sides of the struggle, as the weapons we call computers and software evolve with each passing day. So too must the tactics of cybersecurity. Spending and awareness of mitigating threats, keeping systems up to date, and protecting operations from hijacking has increased, as well as attendance to conferences like the Rail Cybersecurity Summit. It's not just the digital, but the physical dangers as well, where terrorists can exploit the heart of a city's transit system, its stations. On top of the security we have grown accustomed to to the extent in our post-9-11 world, some countries and systems have begun experimenting with adding robots to the mix. In South Korea, four police robots were added to stations to patrol as well as assist passengers in finding information. They can also double as part of a bomb squad to inspect suspicious packages. Some robots aren't as scary, such as SoftBank's Pepperbot now being deployed by Eurostar in London's St. Pancras station to assist customers, answer questions, and yes, even pose for a selfie. Keeping passengers and cargo safe has been a top priority for transportation, and some of the biggest have come from letting robots and automation take control of some instances where human error can be reduced. We see this in automobiles, where over 93% of crashes are caused because of driver-related instances or human error, according to the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration. It's a major problem, America, especially where over 40,000 people are dying each year due to automobile accidents, and that number isn't coming down anytime soon. Advances have been made in that sector, though, due to autonomous or self-driving systems, where Tesla claims that with autopilot on, there has been a crash on average for every 3.34 million miles, compared to the national average of a crash for every 492 thousand miles according to the NHTCA. That's over six to seven times safer in an autonomous vehicle than a non-autonomous vehicle. However, public perception still remains unimpressed, with over 70% of consumers according to a Brookings poll still expressing concerns about autonomous vehicles. And it's not just the public. Take the expert in making connections and researching stories, Malcolm Gladwell. When a Car and Driver 2017 article, he makes the case of where we had a divergence of confusion of where we use this technology, especially given the fact that the resting of autonomy of our vehicles was already won against chauffeurs nearly a hundred years ago, when cars required far more skill to drive and maintain. It's in this confusion that we on this channel conclude that automation and the digital space works better in a system that has a much higher capacity to move people and cargo in a safer and more directly connected system. And that still remains rail transportation. As much as trucks and cars can be automated, they will never be able to move with the same efficiency as a train, which is why rail is far ahead in the digital industrial space. 
General Electric GE, has solutions such as predicts and asset performance management that can monitor trains and detect when parts are about to fail or need replacement parts before it happens. At its highest level, it can even help manage and optimize everything from the performance of trains to the network connections between cargo and products, from mines to ports and everything in between. Call it as you will, a door-to-door -door service for products. Other technologies such as 3D printing are already in use in the rail aftermarket industry. Siemens can 3D print custom and replacement parts for their customers' trains at ease, even using picture references sent by smartphones to conjure up solutions. The technomancing witchcraft doesn't stop there. With thousands of miles of rail, many companies are starting to employ drones to inspect and report on railway issues which can not just save money, but lives. BNSF, the second largest freight railroad network in the US, has been using this for years now. With all this data going around and being created by the amount of sensors, drones, and inputs in the rail market, it's nearly impossible to track all of it. IBM estimated we create about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day in the world. And yeah, that's about 18 zeros and zero people who want to track all of that by hand. Railways have always been about timely data, keeping order and track of things, which is why one solution has been looking at how blockchain technologies can assist in collecting, recording, and organizing much of this decentralized data in a timely and foolproof manner. Some of the companies that have joined the Blockchain and Transport Alliance group have been some of the same names we have been repeating in this video and others on this channel. General Electric, BNSF, Union Pacific, and Florida East Coast Railway. The way this data can be seen will also change. If you think our phones are cool now with the amount of virtual reality and augmented reality technology we have on them, wait till you see what the rail industry already has. VR is already being used for training and maintenance purposes all over the world. Apart from the immediate benefit it has in seeing and testing designs before spending time and money on creation. Augmented Reality or AR is already making it easier for technicians and train drivers to see a variety of information in easy interfaces like the heads up displays used in modern gaming. So yeah, tell your mom next time. Video games may help you land your next job. With it all comes down to how you, the passenger, will be lavishing in the future to come with rail. Here in America, we've heard the same tired story before. Our infrastructure has been falling apart for the past 50 years or so. Some of our bridges and tunnels that Amtrak travels through is more than 100 years old. And there is no way our crumbling roads and highways can take more capacity, even if we paved entire cities out of existence. However, changes have been occurring, and since the election of President Donald Trump in 2016, changes have been rapid. America's GDP is now climbing back to higher levels of growth that were normal decades ago. The unemployment rate is at its lowest level since 1969. Companies have been posting record yearly and quarterly earnings, and the average hourly earnings have increased at their highest level since 2009. What does this all mean? It means we've been more active in the economy and traveling more. In fact, Amtrak has achieved a record-breaking 31.7 million passengers in 2017 and profit for the first time in its history has been able to cover close to 95% of its operating costs with its own revenue. And it's on track to break those records in 2018. Rail operators have had to evolve with the amount of new passengers flowing into their services. Caltrans in California is expecting an increase of 300% by the year 2040. Because of the increased passenger movements and the amount of goods traveling in this booming economy, the way we think about infrastructure spending, investment, and management has had to evolve as well. In America, a highly regulated legal structure for infrastructure building with added years of committee meetings and approval processes has been the norm for critical projects. No longer as the permitting process has been reduced by years through executive orders, streamlining the decision making through a one federal agency instead of multiple, and it's going to be needed. 
as the rail industry is making record amounts of investments to build, modernize, and evolve their fleets, equipment, and infrastructure for the haul ahead. Amtrak, for example, is spending $370 million to upgrade the Northeast Corridor, its main source of economy. This, however, pales in comparison to states like Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Nebraska, California, and Indiana, where a combination of local, state, and a mass influx of private business investment is taking rail business to a whole new level of capital expenditure and expansion to the tune of billions upon billions of dollars. The trillion dollars of total infrastructure investment that the president has promised isn't mostly coming from the federal government. It's coming from these new sources. We have been ingrained with the age-old fallacy within, nonetheless, our own biased government-funded institutions for decades, that the only way to fix infrastructure is more government regulation and more government spending. And like an old haggard vampire in sunlight, that fallacy is falling apart. In the US, we have seen government spending out of control in the past, the most atrocious in the New York City area where over $4 billion of out-of-taxpayer coffers were spent for just a two-mile extension of the queue line. Compared to countries like Japan, Germany, France, and the UK, this is over 22 times the average per mile cost for a slower and less modern system in New York, and sorely over budget and over schedule. Unfortunately, most rail consumers in America haven't seen how systems owned and operated by private companies in Japan, Hong Kong, and Italy can build and run more efficiently. Because of that, they've been blindsided to seeing the bright side of rail in the US, or more apparently, Bright Line, which is setting new precedents in American passenger rail. Bright Line is a project I've been following for the past five years, starting under its development name, All Aboard Florida. Its goal? To be the first privately owned and operated higher speed passenger rail service in the US. Since it opened at the start of 2018, it's been the praise of many. Its stylish, modern, and conveniently located stations with shops, restaurants, are steps away from some of South Florida's biggest attractions. The service on board the sleek and posh train sets capable of 125 miles an hour have been regarded as comfortable and first class, far better than Amtrak, and certainly far better than the airlines which have been at record low approval. Apart from massive legroom, aisles wide enough to allow for wheelchair passage, outlets and USBs to charge modern devices, and large, stable tables, premium food and drinks are included on the Smart Plus and Select service. And getting your golden ticket on this ride is as easy as a few simple taps on a kiosk, ordering online, or through an app, which has become increasingly popular and convenient to do in Europe. Brightline has been a watershed moment in U.S. rail history to show that indeed, private investment is a viable and oftentimes a better solution versus government funding, especially with the constant need to innovate and compete in an important market. Brightline's parent company has extended to buy out another private company looking to ultimately connect Los Angeles to Las Vegas and has inspired a company in Texas called Texas Central to seek funding from Japanese sources to connect Dallas to Houston via a Japanese Dow 205 mile an hour bullet train. Brightline as a business model shows that ultimately, customers want another choice. A choice that is easy, convenient, smart, and quick. It aims to provide that continually as it connects Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, Orlando in 2021, and proposals to Tampa, Jacksonville, and beyond. It's a choice that Americans had before in the glory days of passenger rail in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. But due to a number of reasons explained in this channel, we nearly lost it. Much of this has grown from the automobile and airlines monopoly on travel in North America. The latter industry actively participating to stymie the efforts of high-speed rail especially. In the 80s, Southwest Airlines lobbied heavily and successfully to stop a privately funded bullet train project to connect Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, as it would directly compete in the same area and essentially ruin Southwest Airlines business. The former chairman of American Airlines, Bob Crandall, 
as part of Citizens Against the Train, a lobbying group of country club landowners and retirees that are vehemently against Brightline in the Treasure Coast of Florida. Crandall still has vested interest in the airline industry and hypocritically accuses Brightline of taking taxpayer money, while his and many airlines took billions in taxpayer subsidies. The sentiment along the Treasure Coast, as Brightline ridership continues to rise, has been changing quickly as residents there now want a station to be built in the area. Everything we have gone over summarizes some of the rapid changes that have been occurring in this whizzing and growing industry that has been with us since the first industrial revolution and evolved seamlessly into the modern era. Modern day economies are dependent on the train and maybe no example could prove better than the one we see in Japan, a country that was pummeled and shattered after the second world war it grew to the apex of the world's second largest economy for a time, and even boasting a higher GDP per capita than the US in the 80s briefly. The engine upon which this economic miracle drove upon was the train. Just from briefly looking at the numbers, one can tell how Japan's economic progress increased with the introduction of its Shinkansen system in 1964. The railroads are revered in that country almost to a holy status, as shown in the railway museum in Saitama. Many countries have realized that in order to harness the growth of first world countries, the backbone of rail serves as the catalyst. It's no wonder that China centered its ambitions of trade across Eurasia on rail through its one belt, one road system. Here in the United States, we can realize our own ambitions on rail as well as we transport vast amounts of goods and natural resources efficiently from sea to shining sea. Meaning for you, the citizen, more jobs, a stabler economy, and financial growth. Sooner or later, we will catch up in the passenger rail department, bringing America's urban centers even closer together. Meaning for you, the passenger, more convenience, save time, and a higher standard of living. In the past five years the High Speed Rail America Club has existed, we have realized the vast interconnectivity and breadth of scale passenger rail means for America, especially the connection between high speed, intercity, transit, and metro lines. It ultimately encompasses every facet of our communities as well as lives and breathes through socioeconomic and political issues. But the best is yet to come. This is why we are rebranding. We have gone over the many advances occurring in the rail industry, from the Internet of Things and automation, to new speeds constantly being reached, and more importantly, how you, the passengers, the citizens, and the people of our myriad of nations and economies will benefit in the progress being made in the backbone of our infrastructure system. This is the train of the future, and you are now embarking on the American Rail Club. Thank you all for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe to the now American Rail Club and be sure to click the bell to receive updates easy and conveniently at bullet train speeds. Comment below on what you believe the future holds for railroads and trains in your country and feel free to discuss with your fellow passengers in the comments below. Support the future of the American Rail Club on Patreon where patrons will receive more updates and special behind the scenes look at the making of these videos. If you found this video fun and exciting, be sure to share with your friends and family. Thank you for your support. Next stop, the future.